You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to Faith and Other Oddities. We're glad to be back in the studio. we got kind of a special uh, program. We have an interview episode today. We don't normally do those, but um, we're happy to have uh, the woman who's uh, blowing up uh, reform <laughs> Twitter lately. Uh, <laughs> we have Amy Bird in this, uh, well, via Skype. Amy, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you guys doing? We're having fun. Uh, we're yeah. a little crazy, but good. we got, you know, <laughs> just, just crazy you know we're, yeah we're, like we mentioned earlier before we got started we're me and my wife are buying and selling a house we had a child broken arm just just nuts it's we're back to school crazy. which is always stressful because we me and my wife were both work at a school um, oh so does <laughs> so, my husband yeah yeah so you know what this time of year is like yeah it's crazy and then you throw in uh i don't know is as your husband is he getting to go back live or is are they no. doing digital <laughs> It's virtual and he's freaking out. <laughs> yeah, we, I understand we're, we're in a, we're at a private school, so we're going to go back live, but we actually have it set up so that the classes are isolated. Uh-huh. And so if there's one case in a grade level, that grade level alone can go virtual uh, okay. for two, you know, for two, three weeks, however long it takes to get cleared up. But we're, it still adds a, everywhere's a logistical nightmare there's, this year. <laughs> whatever the decisions are, they're all difficult and challenging right now absolutely yeah and yeah. everyone's gonna think you're wrong you, you yeah. may, <laughs> oh yeah there's my, no that, winning <laughs> yeah the, the headmaster of our school has fielded so many emails i'm like i don't think you could pay me enough to have his job i know he's... <laughs> i know a lot of upset parents so but anyway well we're not here to talk about that um <laughs> we're here to to talk about what you've been doing um so as i mentioned uh you've been blowing up the reform twitter um with I guess the Presbyterian too, they technically kind of fall in the same group, kind of the Reformed Baptist Presbyterian. They run pretty close together. Yeah, uh, yeah. close. <laughs> yeah, well, and the cause of that, the primary cause of that, is this book that you wrote called "Recovering from Biblical Manhood and Womanhood." And uh, we want to, I want to talk about that, and I want to kind of get a little more background on who you are and why you chose to write, write this book, and why you felt like this was the time to write it. So if we could just kick off, kind of with you know, who are you? Give us some context for why we want to talk to Amy Bird. Who am I? Well, that's a good question. That's when I ask myself, actually, <laughs> like, who am I to even be doing this? Um, really, so I am a 44-year-old lay woman who, uh, this is my fifth book. And I began writing, not because I had an ambition to be an author or um, anything like that, actually. Um, I've always enjoyed writing and I've always taken like writing classes, but my major is actually in education. And, um, I married very early, right out of college, 21 years old. And, uh, both my husband and I come from divorced families. Um, for me, it happened like when I was 15 years old, my parents got divorced. So it was pretty devastating. Like I didn't, didn't think that that would happen to my family. And so I grew up in a Southern Baptist Christian home. Um, So it really rocked my faith in some ways. And um, so when my husband and I married, I just really wanted to do this right. I didn't want to get divorced. I wanted to have a a joyful marriage and I wanted to be a good wife. So um, I'm listening to Christian radio and picking up the latest, you know, resources that could help me learn. And um, much of it came from the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, um, which I'll further refer to as CBMW, just because it's easier to say, but um, they had put out this book called Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. And a lot of the contributors in the book were people that I had been learning from, pastors that I've been learning from, writers that I've been learning from. I appreciate a lot Mm -hmm. of their teaching. Um, But then I also saw some really concerning things in that book. But you know, who am I? Right. <laughs> That's the question again, right? Like I'm in my early twenties and, and these guys, you know, seem to have it figured out. So I didn't want to question that. And so I began writing you know, a little bit later, you know, had three kids. And as soon as they were like school age, 
I'd really done a lot of growing and teaching some Bible studies and just learning with other women. And my husband and I had moved and um, I found it to be a very lonely town for a theological thinker. Um, it was a socially Christian town. Just about everybody in the town went to church. Um, the public schools celebrate Christmas and all those kind of things. But um, there was no theology behind it. It was just morality. And um, mm-hmm. so I really saw this, this need uh, for people to see, like, you know, what you believe about God affects your everyday life. There's, you know, there's reasoning behind all of this. Um, and it's not just a legalism. Mm-hmm. So um, it was a lonely place for me, too, as a, as a thinker, because <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, pretty... Yeah, I'd grown with this group of women at my other church and because we all had a lot of questions, you know, we just mm-hmm. wanted to think. And so um, it led me to write Housewife Theologian, my first book, which is just showing that we're all theologians. Mm-hmm. We can be good ones, <laughs> right. poor, but we all have some sort of knowledge about who God is and right. it matters mm-hmm. and it affects the way that we live. So um, that's it led me. It was kind of the book that I was looking for to talk with these women about. Um, and couldn't find. So that's what led me to write. And then that kind of entered me into this kind of wider evangelical world with parachurch organizations. Mm -hmm. And um, I was invited to co-host a podcast with an academic and a pastor, um, which led to some great opportunities as far as meeting lots of authors and academics and Mm -hmm. having great conversations. However, um, over the years, I was really noticing some themes as a woman <laughs> in this conversation. I can and imagine. <laughs> yeah, in church life. So um, my writing and my uh, podcasting uh, gave me opportunities to speak at different churches, conferences, things like that, which is another thing I never really sought out. But um, these, you know, I, these opportunities were presented to me. So I... I did it. And um, what a blessing it is to be able to meet uh, Christians, brothers and sisters all over the place mm-hmm. um, and be in so many different churches and just see how God is working. But um, a- another sad thing is that uh, over and over, I keep seeing the same theme of women coming to me and saying, you know, they want to be invested in more as a disciple. Mm-hmm. They want to be able to um, contribute uh, more in the theological mm-hmm. life of the church and the intellectual life of the church. Um, even in their like women's ministries, they found that um, they're given all this freedom to teach in a woman's ministry in the church, but it's kind of held at arm's length from mm-hmm. the rest of the church and they're not being equipped well. Yes. So they don't even have the um, resources or the, um, the discipleship <laughs> right. in order for them to um, be able to teach. And so, when they would, they don't want to be troublemakers. Mm-hmm. They're trying to approach this well and communicate well with whoever the church leadership is, you know, depending on the denomination. And, um, but they're, they're not getting anywhere. And so there's a lot of frustration or a lot of them are frustrated with the resources that they're having to sit mm-hmm. under in their ministries, uh, full of theological error yes. and just fluff. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I've had, pa- you know, a lot of pastors contacting me about this to, um, oh, I didn't realize that the women were studying this book. And now mm-hmm. that I see what it is, it's really troubling, but they're mad at me for saying something. You know, there's just all kinds of um, interrelational <laughs> issues I'm finding between the men and the women in the churches. You and, were singing my song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it led me to write, well, I wrote a book called Theological Fitness, just was doing theology on perseverance and Hebrews and um, what it takes to persevere. That book did not get, that's my least selling book. Um, And it's interesting because it was marketed to men and women, just a regular book about theology Mm -hmm. written by a woman, you know? Yeah. Um, So my next book was uh, No Little Women and kind of addressing what I'm talking to you about right now. But I found that there, you know, it's like you scratch the surface of something or you start peeling away the the chip paint and you find out like there's bigger issues everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I found in my own relating, my own trying to communicate and in talking to many, many women and women who are in seminary, um, there's a huge um, wall, a huge, huge way of thinking that has kind of stopped women from being able to 
participate in discipleship the same yes. way as men. And that is just the very fact that men don't even think that women should be friends with them. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we leave the heavy theological lifting to the boys. That's what I have always been taught as a Southern Baptist uh, woman or grew up in a Southern Baptist church. And so a lot of your story actually sounds very, very familiar. Mm -hmm. And it's not just my story. It's the story of many women. Exactly. Which is what, what really motivates me to write is, is the other women, you know, mm -hmm. just see it everywhere. Um, so yeah, I wrote a book called Why Can't We Be Friends? Because I really noticed um, how this is a barrier, mm -hmm. a huge barrier. It's just the ability to view one another holistically mm -hmm. um, and as brothers and sisters in the household of God. Yes. Instead, women, very bodies are looked at as threats and um, need to be managed. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought there is a I think we need to go deeper into the theology behind all of that. So I wrote that book and that did get some backlash that got, that was controversial, which to me is pretty sad um, that friendship and, you know, I'm focusing on promoting holiness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> in that book and one another, like that's our main um, obligation as a friend. Right. Uh, because we were all made uh, for eternal communion with the triune God and one another. Yes. And do we believe that or not? And how does that change the way we view one another, especially if our status is union with Christ? Um, we're brothers and sisters, and mm -hmm. we know how to treat brothers and sisters. So when Paul tells us love one another deeply as brothers and sisters, we know what that means. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. So I wrote like, that book. Oh, well, I was going to say, yeah. I, I maybe kind of jumping ahead here, but you know, just some of the standards that are put forth, you're talking about like the why we can't be friends thing. You know, I'm a school janitor and okay. I work maintenance. So, you know, mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day, if I'm up there working and there's another, you know, there's only one woman in the building, you know, most of the teachers are women. So by some of the standards put forth by some of these books, you know, right. I can't even do my job as a janitor. But the problem is she <laughs> should leave, not you. <laughs> Well, and that's the huge, because my husband is in elementary education. So mm -hmm. he works with a lot of women and, you know, he will be attending meetings sometimes with a woman mm -hmm. uh, from his school and they're going to meet with other educators in other schools. Mm -hmm. um, is he not to have lunch with her during, <laughs> you know, the, the lunch break? Mm -hmm. uh, and it depends on who you are, I would say, right? You know, every situation is different. But the blanket rules that we put on making all women dangerous and sexual temptresses and all men unable to control animalistic drives. Right. Um, <laughs> that just paints a picture of living under the bondage of sin, mm -hmm. not um, living under the reign of grace where we have the Holy Spirit. I love that. I love yeah, that, that because we we tend to. Yes. As a woman who spent, you know, I went to seminary. I was the only woman in my particular degree program. Uh, everyone else got a lot of guys, a lot of guy friends and how dare I have male friends. And I actually had people, usually males approach me and say, how can you hang out with these people? Don't you realize what you're doing? Don't you, you know, you've yeah, got your really sad. Yeah. You, uh, I thought they called it my mantourage because I was always wow. hanging. Yeah. This is the kind of language Sorry. that the body yeah. uses about those of us who know how to have healthy relationships because they were all right. platonic. They were all brothers. Right. And, you know, most of them were five to 10 years younger than me. And so it was, it was wonderful to have that community and that kind of relationship, but it was so suspect in that yeah, setting. I, mean, I get that in, in the theological world mm -hmm. as a woman. And, you know, even I think it was the turning point for me is at one point I found myself walking and I kind of put this in the beginning of the book, found myself walking from a restaurant at night in a sketchy couple alleys, a couple mm -hmm. blocks I had to go to my car in the rain in a big city by myself mm -hmm. um, when I could have been given a ride to my car, but it was because I was a woman. Right, right. And I, so I thought, wow, all this teaching about biblical manhood and, and male leadership and protection, mm -hmm. uh, they're protecting their own reputation. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. At the cost at, of being safety as a woman. I have a feeling we can finish each other's sentences on a lot of this stuff because <laughs> you are, yes, we're on the same page with this. Yeah. So then I was like, you know what? I'm, people are not going to like it, but I'm writing this book. So I wrote that. And then, um, I, you know, another letter, layer 
to it then is really just head on addressing this, um, some of the troubling teaching from CBMW regarding what they define as mm-hmm. biblical manhood, biblical womanhood. And for me in the book, I wanted, what I really want to talk about is discipleship. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's my path. Um, that's, that's where all these books have come out of. And so um, as a lay person, I've had these opportunities to be able to go upstairs and have a conversation with academics and pastors and, and, um, and also to go downstairs and have a conversation with, you know, people like me. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I'm trying to do in this book is re-examine some of these teachings from the last 30 years. You, know, they're <laughs> you mean they haven't been here forever? These are not, you know, Jesus didn't decree all these traditions. <laughs> They are built off of some old, you know, I would say Greek ideas and um, the ancient ideas about man and woman and and then later Victorian ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're old in that way. But um, this biblical manhood and womanhood stuff is a movement. And I want to be able to critically look at that movement and say, hey, there's some things we can appreciate about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they wanted to speak out as a church, as a voice against the um the sexual revolution. And I too want to be able to do that. But I actually think their teaching is harming our witness um, instead of helping it as a church. I, I absolutely agree. And you know, the, uh, the council for biblical manhood and womanhood has become the gold standard in many of our communities for how do you evaluate women's roles? Um, mm-hmm. So you, you kind of told us that they had an impact on your views, but as you're moving out of this kind of phase, what, what are some of the more troubling teachings you see them promoting? <laughs> well, um, I would say the most troubling teaching that was coming out. Um, and I kind of started a firestorm with that four years ago on my blog um, is the eternal subordination of the sun. So starting right with the, the um, doctrine of God, right. Um, of the Trinity. Um, there's a serious error that is unorthodox that they're teaching. And that is that the son um, in his very essence and his very being is eternally subordinate to the father's authority. And this is huge because we know that in his incarnation and in his role as a mediator, um, the son does submit to the father, but he does that as our mediator. Right. Um, that is not, uh, that's part of his economic vocation. That's not part of his essence. Um, there are not two or three wills in the Trinity. There's one divine will. So there, there can't be this ontological authority and submission. Um, and Very good point. Yeah. And there's another doctrine called, you know, inseparable operations that, you know, the Trinity is working together in everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that also is you know, affected by this, this unorthodox teaching. Um, and then, you know, we learn in scripture that the son had to learn obedience. Mm -hmm. So there's just multiple levels of wrongness about this teaching. Um, and we want to know God correctly. He wants us to know him correctly. He's revealed himself to us in his word and our, our most, our oldest creeds, Mm -hmm. um, tell, you know, teach us differently than this doctrine. So, um, that was a addressed in 2016 and the teaching coming out of CBMW there, it was on, on their articles about the Trinity on their website. It was, it's in their big book, recovering biblical manhood and womanhood, this teaching. Um, it's not by all the contributors, but, uh, by one of the editors of the book. Mm -hmm. Um, it's at their conferences and it was really ramping up lately in their conferences. It's in their resources for women's ministries. Um, it's, it's just flavored everywhere out of coming out of CBMW. Um, many of their contributors taught this and mm-hmm. their president the latest book really was teaching it just straightforwardly. And he was promoting it at their conferences and saying that like, this is the gospel. Oh, wow. Um, that's pretty concerning. And so what they do is they use this teaching uh, and it's ESS is the short word for it. And there's some other acronyms that, mm-hmm. you know, think are ESS functional is... a couple other things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Anyway, they use that teaching to then say comparatively, uh, men ontologically in their very being are authority figures Mm -hmm. and women in our being are to be subordinate to men. And like that is who the essence is of who we are. 
Um, and so this is getting taught in, in a lot of women's resources. It's been found in some children's resources that they had put out. Um, very concerning um, stuff. So I would say that is the most concerning. And, and even their very definitions um, in the book of mature um, masculinity and mature femininity to uh, echo this teaching. So uh, John Piper's definition in his in that book, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, says at the heart of mature masculinity is a sense of benevolent responsibility to lead, provide for, and protect women in ways appropriate to a man's differing relationships. At the heart of mature femininity is a freeing disposition to affirm, receive, and nurture strength and leadership from worthy men in ways appropriate to a woman's differing relationships. So the very definition of mature femininity robs her of any person, personhood yes. of her own self. Um, there's nothing there that she offers. It's just to affirm male leadership. It's parasitic. I actually just read your quote where you said that in one of your recent articles. Uh, mm -hmm. Nathan, I were driving uh, earlier this morning and I read that. I'm like, wow, Amy, don't hold back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and this has had, I think a lot of people don't realize that Theology does impact our day to day living, even if we don't know all of the proper terms or, you know, the, the fancy words for it. This has played out and it has contributed to abuse of women. It has. And you know, that, I'm not saying that's a motivation at all of CBMW. Right. However, it has this teaching has been helped fuel abuse because and, you know, the way that it's been taken by so many is that. Uh, Basically, male authority is a dictatorship. Yes. And, and women are told that they have to submit to it. Well, and I've found that many women who have been raised in this kind of culture, they are not emotionally or spiritually prepared to stand up to a man who is not worthy. Because how do you determine what man is worthy when so many of the sources out there, he's worthy simply because he's male? And. Well, and she is to be quiet and docile and, um, you know, that uh, they're being raised. And, and in seminaries, even men are told to look for these really submissive, docile women. I have a story to tell you one day. I, I won't steal your time <laughs> with it. <but laughs> and, and if people don't think that men are out there, I'm just going to leave it with this. Men, if they don't think men are specifically targeting women. Who not make, all men, but that, that there some, are men. Yes, there are some men <laughs> who are specifically targeting women who will make good victims. Uh, they've lost their minds. Um, and I, I'm holding back with this interview because so much of what you're saying, I, I just want to like go jump in and mm -hmm. uh, yes, because I, I have seen this and it's like I said, not my life all the time, but also with other women. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I, I will get off my hobby horse and let you go back to <laughs> <laughs> because it's a huge issue. And yeah, I, and, and they teach in the book to the degree that a woman's influence over a man is personal and directive. It will generally offend, offend a man's good, God-given sense of responsibility and leadership, and thus controvert God's created order. Oh, my. So women have to be careful not to give any personal or direct guidance to a man, or they're offending God's created order and his manliness. And so they get into detailed ways of how this can be played out. Um, you know, right down from like the man drives the car, uh, the woman's in the passenger seat, he orders for her at the restaurant, a woman has to be making sure that, you know, if the mailman comes to the door that he's, he's mm -hmm. sensing the fact that she is affirming his masculine leadership <laughs> and delivering the mail. Um, you know, is it okay for a man who's lost if he sees, you know, the only person outside is like a housewife in her yard? Is he able, how will he be able to ask her for directions in a way that won't offend his masculinity? Um, uh, to they me, talk that, about that just seems women's silly. strength training and how, you know, you don't want hard muscles. You know, uh, yeah. you need to be soft or your feminine needs won't be met. This, this. I mean, it's all in the book. Oh, yeah. I, I, and I've read some of the list and I, I believe it's Wayne Grudem who provides the list of the things that women are allowed to do. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's in the book, too. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And, and see, to me, like the ordering at the restaurant, um, a lot of times my wife has a lot of substitutions and things. And I'm like, you know, you can keep track of that better than I can. Just go for it. You know, I, well, you also had well, three older sisters. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't even understand why they're wanting to take the woman's voice so much. And, you know, it's all taught under um, the premise that the men are to lovingly lead, you know, mm-hmm. And that that is a service to his wife, but um, I, it's almost like stunting her very growth, mm-hmm. and 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 it's certainly hurting his growth too to not have input input from you know a necessary ally in their relationship. I did love that term. I thought that was a fantastic way to define the Hebrew there. That necessary mm-hmm. ally. It was just it's a great picture, and the fact that God uses of uses it of Himself. Yeah, I think that's an important thing we need to to look at, and especially when we talk about ESS, God says I'm the helper, and mm-hmm. so when we we look at that in contrast, I, I thought you made excellent points there, and and the yeah. brother and sister language I thought was particularly interesting. But of course, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I'm on the podcast with my brother, so I've got a I good know, relationship. It's, it's, it's great, yeah. <laughs> and so when. When you're addressing these things, um, do people have a good pushback or are they largely dismissive because you are a woman bringing up these topics? Um, I think there's some good critique. Um, I've had, I think, the whole range between um, good critique and then just pure hatred. Uh, I've had a lot of misrepresentation of my work, Mm -hmm. which is um, extremely frustrating. because then it kind of poisons the well mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. Uh, with things that I didn't actually say mm-hmm. uh, to people who haven't read the book. And so that's the most frustrating. Um, but some of the good critique, I believe, um, and, and this was a challenge for me in some ways, because for one thing, the book covers such a broad range Very much of so. topics that need developed, the thinking needs developed even more. And mm-hmm. I, agree, I agree with that. Like I'm starting something here. Um, but it isn't fully developed and, and I would love for, for more, um, more people to write about it and, and do that as well. And, and I hope to continue to do that. Um, also some good critique. So I come from, I'm a member of the Orthodox Presbyterian church, okay. um, a pretty conservative denomination, a pretty small denomination, but we have very, um, distinct, uh, book of church order of how, you know, worship is done. So. Um, and in our worship, we only have church officers leading. Mm-hmm. So lay men aren't to be praying during a worship mm-hmm. service or um, or administering sac- sacraments, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's not a man woman thing as much as it is a church officer thing. And then it's only qualified men who are church officers in my denomination. Mm-hmm. But I'm writing to a bigger audience than the OPC. Right. Um, so I, you know, when I get into some of the applicatory stuff about, um, about worship and men, men and women in worship, I kind of touch on some of those different things and it's going to be different, um, in, in different churches. Mm-hmm. So I'm writing to a broader audience. So I, I did get some critique on that. I got a lot of critique on positively quoting from egalitarians, um, and guilty. <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty. Right. I think that, uh, Egalitarians, I'm not an egalitarian, but I very much appreciate the work of many egalitarians. Um, and it has sharpened my thinking um, in good ways and challenging ways. I think that there's some rich stuff about men and women in some of their writing. They're upholding the thor- authority of scripture themselves. Um, and I think we need to uh, read more broadly. So that's one reason why I included a lot of egalitarian um, scholarship sure. in the book. Well, you can um, take someone's, you can take one or two of someone's ideas and go, hey, you know what, th- on this, they're right, without right. having to accept all their, the all full corpus of their work, you know? Right. I mean, I also quote several Roman Catholic theologians, including mm-hmm. Pope John II, mm-hmm. um, and I haven't gotten a lot of critique until like this week for that, um, <laughs> <laughs> before they weren't really concerned that I was a closet Roman Catholic. Um, but so... <laughs> I, I I also quote from a lot of complementarians in the book mm-hmm. too. But, um, another critique was that I I didn't deal with um, the Tim, you know First Timothy two verse yes. about uh, authority. Um, now my book is about discipleship, not church leadership. I see that that um, 
that verse being more about um, church office. Okay. So it, it didn't make a difference really in the book. I didn't write about marriage either. And they were really wanting me to, to talk about some of these marriage verses. Yes. Um, the book's about discipleship. Um, however, you know, maybe it would have been better if I would have included some of those things. I'm not sure. I mean, you know, it's worth thinking about. Um, I certainly have stuff to say about it, but it would have made the book bigger. Um, so we're never going to complain about a longer book at our, <laughs> yes. you know, other people might. And then there was complaining that, uh, or I, mean, I shouldn't say complaining, but critique that, um, you know, I, I interpret the verse about Junia that she really was an apostle. I, I kind of take it at face value. I don't, uh, I don't interpret that to be one of the 12 apostles, right. but the ones who had met some certain qualifications about seeing the resurrected Christ mm-hmm. and being commissioned as a missionary. Um, and I do. I, and so they, they didn't think I included enough of the arguments against that. I mean, I did kind of briefly say something about the arguments against that. Um, it's what? not an academic book. That's the hard part. It's like, if it was more academic, then I'd get into the different arguments. More. Right. Um, but it's also not your typical popular level book either because it's dealing with some kind of academic um, concepts. So it's nope. kind of a hard genre, to, you know, to. Uh, yeah. To, it's just to find that little niche. I was actually, that was one of the things Nathan and I talked about that, you know, when, okay, so I'm just going to be really honest. When I see a theological book or any book written by a woman for women, I tend to walk away from it. Just yeah, I know. The, yeah. <laughs> and so it's like I, I had no desire to read anything you wrote just based on the fact you're a woman. And that's horrible for me as a woman yeah. to feel that way. But it's just because of the level of scholarship I typically see in mm-hmm. books aimed at women. So um, when I got your book and I was actually I was waiting, I, I got it because um, let me back up on that a little bit. I got it because I saw who was offering the critiques and I saw <laughs> the names and I'm like, what did she say that could make people so mad? I read the uh-huh. whole thing, waiting to see what you said that could make people so mad. Yeah. And I really see it as a book of questions. And mm-hmm. that's how I viewed it. And yeah, right. It's not a, an academic book. You don't break apart all the arguments. And that mm-hmm. was one of the main critiques I'd seen that you had not addressed, quote, the significant text. So interestingly yeah. enough, they're complaining that she's not doing enough teaching in the book. <laughs> Is that what's the what we're seeing here? Yeah. Oh, it's not the book that they wanted me to write. Precisely. You know? Yeah. They wanted me to. They wanted me to write a lot more about whether or not um, women can be in leadership and and things like in like ordained leadership. Well, um, since you brought that up, what are your views? Just so that we can. Yeah, because because there is a lot of misinformation about what your views are, and there you, are there you, you mentioned that earlier, and it's like, yep, we've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, like I said, I'm in the OPC, and um, we uphold that uh, pastors and elders are for qualified uh, men only. Okay, and I do believe that. Um, and my, you know, even though I think that First Timothy two is an important text. Um, to talk about there, that's not really my reasoning so much for, mm-hmm. for why I hold that. For me, it's a, it's a theological. It's more of the meta narrative of scripture and that um, Christ is masculine. And I believe that he, he's appointed men to represent him in his church as kind of like the best man to the groom, just like uh, John the Baptist uh, identifies himself in John 3. Okay. Um, so, or is it John 4? I'm not sure now. <laughs> But um, so I see it at that role. And, you know, some of the ancient church fathers explain it that way as well. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not a new thought. And I think that's beautiful because um, I do believe one of the biggest uh, stories that our bodies tell as men and women is Christ's love for his bride, his Mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. So that's where where I stand on that. But I I do think that uh, we have kind of reduced that to the men lead the women in the church. And I just don't think that that's so because, and, you know, I'm really doing a lot of work in the Song of Songs right now. And um, you see this beautiful um, and fleshing of the whole story of scripture mm-hmm. in the song. And um, the man who I see as, as representative of Christ, um, 
he encourages his bride to speak. Let me hear your voice. That's like the last thing he says to her. <laughs> it's such That's a really good point. Jellical book, you know, and, and she's calling him at the end to the spice laden mountains, which is Zion, which her mm-hmm. very body represents. You see the typology all through mm-hmm. the song. And her voice um, bookends the song. It, mm-hmm. it bursts through immodestly in the very beginning, like, oh, that he would kiss me with the kisses of his lips, you know, or the kisses of his mouth. And, and then she calls him at the end. And so I see that as a role of the whole church. And, and you see that with um, the, the woman at the well, which mm-hmm. is such a, a, a wedding story there. And she, what does she do? She drops her bucket and goes and, and tells the whole town. It's mm-hmm. very evangelical. Um, the, in Revelation, when we, we see, well, scripture begins and closes with a wedding, mm-hmm. um, but this, this eschatological picture here, here we have of the bride joining her voice with a spirit, calling her brothers and sisters to come to the living water, which her very body represents as a homology. So I think that there should be a lot more reciprocity within the body of Christ, um, yeah. not only between men and women um, in our our responsibility to communicate God's word to one another and so that we can commune in it together. Mm -hmm. Um, But also just as unique, unrepeatable human beings. Yes. I I love that. Now, one of the terms you used in your book was gynocentric interruptions. (laughs) And I recently heard a, a popular female podcaster encourage her listeners not to Google that term and that if it sounds dirty, it's because it is. So oh, I would, oh yeah. Uh, so I would well, like you to define that term for our audience because I don't want them to be scared of it. Really? And, uh, uh, golly. Well, first of all, it's not my term that I originated from me. I took right. it from Richard Baum, who I don't think anybody would accuse of being perverted or dirty. Um, <laughs> And it was that more academic book called Gospel Women, um, where he examines the named women in the Gospels. But really, he takes you all through Scripture. And so he he uses this term, gynocentric interruption, which is a female-centered mm-hmm. interruption of the text. So there's nothing dirty about that. That's what it means. <laughs> female-centered. Um, so most of the t- most of Scripture we see is androcentric. It's um, mm-hmm. you know written throughout a very patriarchal period. Um, so it's quite amazing then to see how the female voice functions within scripture, you know, at such a, a, a patriarchal culture yes. and time. Um, and that when we see the female voice interrupt, it's often to show us uh, the story behind the story mm-hmm. and it makes visible invisible. So you're getting something that you wouldn't just get from the male centered perspective alone. And he uses the book of Ruth as a, a model of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, probably not written by a woman. However, we have this rich narrative told to us in the feminine perspective. Um, and then at the end, though, we have this patrilineal genealogy that kind of is a total gear shift mm-hmm. that um, it's very abrupt, almost like it's just cut and paste there at the end. But uh, Richard Bauckham says, what we see here is this comparison. <laughs> um, the patrilineal genealogy is kind of the androcentric story. Um, but uh, so it's, it's, it's there to kind of show us that, wow, we just read that exact, you know, that exact same history in the book of Ruth, but um, we're reading it from the view of an outsider and a woman and a widow. Um, so you get a lot more of the story in that about God's hesed love for his people. Um, and so God is using all kinds of different voices um, by his Holy Spirit in uh, showing us that we are all tradents of the faith. We are all passing down. Um, And have that responsibility and great honor to be passing down the faith to the next generation and and to one another. We're storytellers. I I love that. And actually, I was always kind of on the fence between the complementarian and the egalitarian side of things. And then Mm -hmm. we actually just concluded not that long ago a study of judges. And the women in judges are just amazing. Blow your mind. And uh, yeah, it's it's great. And uh, Anyway, I won't go over all of that, but I kind of, I think I tilted more egalitarian at that point. And in your book, you, um, you said that you can no longer call yourself a complementarian. So where do you see yourself falling on this spectrum? Yeah, I don't, um, I don't prefer either of those terms, complementarian, egalitarian. Um, You know, they can be helpful in some ways, but um, (laughs) complementarianism is 
you know, the word itself, it was a beautiful word, I think, but uh, complementarianism is what you associate it with. And, and that's a movement. That's mm-hmm. a movement started pretty much by CBMW, um, a parachurch organization that uh, benefits off of keeping this movement going and its conferences and its books and all their leaders and all this other stuff. And there is a lot of baggage that a lot of error, a lot of bad teaching um, attached to that movement. And there's been a lot of damage in the church because of it. So I will not call myself a complementarian now because of that. And I I don't align with a lot of what they teach about men and women. Um, So I just prefer to say that I'm confessional. You know, I'm part of a confessional church. I think that our confessions are um, very helpful in in helping us read scripture. And and that should be great uh, guardrails for us Mm -hmm. to have freedom within the bounds of our confessions to discuss uh, topics such as as this and even have healthy disagreement and still be able to be safe inside the same churches or ecclesial bodies because we have our confessions. Now, I have another term I also want to ask you about, like the very first accusation that's lobbed out anytime I see your name mentioned negatively is you're a feminist. Do you yeah. consider yourself to be a feminist? And how <laughs> would you define that? Yeah, I guess it, I guess it depends on how you define feminist. That's such a, mm-hmm. a widely defined word now. Um, I do not consider myself a feminist because I would think that most people are thinking about radical feminism and third wave feminism and um, pro-abortion and all all of these other things, uh, sexual revolution, and then in the church, uh, female ordination. Mm -hmm. Um, However, I do very much (laughs) promote uh, a woman's voice being shared and, 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 hey, I'm all for women voting and women's rights and and things like that. So, I mean, I guess it depends on how you define a feminist. That, that's that been something I've run up against myself. And, you know, it's you almost hate that so much baggage comes with some of these words. Yeah. Because I don't even it's, it's not helpful. And honestly, it's being used just to dismiss me. Mm-hmm. Right. It's being used as a word to be able to dismiss anything I write. Um, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not writing about feminism. Actually, the time I'm writing about feminism in the book, I'm saying that, you know, the radical feminists say that the Bible is this patriarchal construction put together by the most powerful men to subdue women. And as the church, we want to balk at that and say, no, 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 that's not true. However, uh, complementarianism um, with the resources that it puts out for women is sending the exact same message that the Bible is so male centered that we need our own resources as women to be able to understand it well. I really like that. And I love the fact that you talk about how the Bibles, even the Bibles themselves are marketed differently to, to women. And so I want to ask you two questions. One, if you could explain a little bit more about what the impact that's had on women, but what kind of Bible do you carry? (laughs) Is it pink? Does it have flowers? (laughs) No, I don't carry a pretty Bible because I don't think everything in it's pretty. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have several different Bibles. Um, I have my travel size Bible, and uh, that one is what, what translation? I have different translations, you know. You need different so ones. my travel size Bible is the New American Standard, but I've been reading the most out of my Christian Standard Bible. Um, I have some different study Bibles. Uh, some have just been sent to me, you know, as a, a blogger and a podcaster, uh, you know, I get mm-hmm. books sent to you and, um, and there's some really helpful study Bibles, but as far as like everyday reading, I, I prefer not to use a, a study Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so I don't have, I do have two copies of the woman's devotional Bible, but they were both sent to me for free. <laughs> Maybe teach you something. I, I'm sorry. Uh, my <laughs> sarcasm's coming out. <laughs> well, you know, you got to be careful sometimes what books you send me because that was like, you know, as I'm looking through it, that was really good fodder for me to use in my critique of it. When I'm like, oh, what does the men's Bible say? Um, one, so of that things, just yeah, the questions. one of the things I really appreciated uh, was that you even noted that because I, I'm one of those that it's like, we're going to talk about the Bible. Let's talk about the Bible. Let's dig in. Let's look at the Hebrew. Let's look at the Greek, let's, mm. the historical uh, stuff. And, you know, when I do a women's event, I don't want to go have tea and talk about each other's shoes. That, that 
just mm-hmm. doesn't. I mean, I love my shoes. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> um, so the fact that you brought that out and I had, don't think I had actually stopped to think about what an impact, you know, pretty Bibles have on the way we view uh, the word of God. Yeah. And as an artist, you think I would have gotten that. So I, <laughs> I thought that was wonderful that you bring it out. And so one of the other things I was wanting to ask you about the, the bride metaphor, you talked about that some earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the critiques I heard was that you take it too far. Do you think you take it too far that it, it, it's um, that, you know, Christ shouldn't have been washing his bride, empowering her, wanting to hear the voice of his beloved? Do you, do you feel like you ever crossed any lines to defend your point of view that you shouldn't have or? Um, I don't know if I've crossed any lines. Um, I find a lot of invisible fences <laughs> that I've crossed, but um, as far as taking the, the marriage metaphor too far, you know, I've been uh, told that myself, like, aren't you taking that a little too far? And, and I, again, want to say that the Bible begins with a wedding. It ends with a wedding. We see the major prophets like Hosea and Isaiah, Isaiah Jeremiah, all using this marriage metaphor uh, with Israel and God. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, even talking about being adulterous and a harlot. Mm-hmm. Um, Ezekiel 16, goodness. Yeah. And, and then we have the Song of Songs, which is right smack in the middle of scripture, mm-hmm. um, which, I, like I said, I really... And sad, I want to bring that back to the church in, in um, a good reading, not, you know, allegorism type of reading, but um, how we see the typology of man and woman in there and Christ's love for his church. I'm, it used to be called the Holy of Holies of Scripture. Um, and there was so much written on the song. And um, since uh, modern criticism, it's been reduced to just being about marriage and sex. And um, yes, <laughs> not to say that there isn't a lot to learn about, you know, uh, those things in there. Um, but the way that it's been so reduced, it's not even a theological book anymore. And it's in scripture. I mean, on the road to Emmaus, Christ is t- telling the disciples about how all of scripture points to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the song is pretty clearly pointing to our bridegroom. And then we have this um, first miracle being performed at a wedding. <laughs> we have the um, John the Baptist, you know, being called the best man. and then. Christ being called the bridegroom, and then this whole story of the woman at the well, um, when wells in scripture were where you went to find a bride. Um, mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> and then um, you have Paul, I think, breaking it down in Ephesians 5, the great mystery uh, that marriage points to Christ's love for his church. Paul is interpreting creation account for us there. Mm-hmm. Um, so he is reimagining like for us the whole mysterious thing of how we are to look at this and it is blow your mind crazy. Um, and then you go to all the way to the end to revelation and we have a wedding. Mm-hmm. So I think that, um, I'm not making too much of it because scripture makes a lot out of it. Yeah. And see, and I think it's interesting because I I've seen in some of the other writings and quotes from, from other pastors who are on the other side of it, who they take the marriage metaphor to be, about the church and his and our relationship to Christ, and they take it to the other extreme where if you know the only the only thing that it matters is just don't get divorced because then you're destroying the image and whatever goes on inside that is okay. Right, and that's that's the other side of it that we we have to watch out for, and it can become dangerous. Mm-hmm, you're right, and and. Well, that could be a whole other podcast. <laughs> sure. Well, maybe but we can have you back. That's a productive view again, you know, about the way to look at it. And, and it usually hurts the women. Yep. It does. And I, I don't think we can say that enough. And I know there's a lot of people who, who want to push back against that. But, I mean, you've seen it with your stuff. I've seen some comments that have been made about you. I'm not going to go over them because uh, they're, they're horrible. And the fact that any brother would say that about his sister, I mean, I would have knocked Nathan out by now if he would have said any of this stuff about (laughs) me, but he wouldn't. I don't have to worry about my brother treating me that way. Right. Right. And that's the fact that we, we as Christians can't respond to a logical argument in a better way. It's heartbreaking. And once I get past my offense, I'm heartbroken that the church can't entertain questions. And so... I appreciate the fact that you've brought these questions to the forefront. Um, 
And that's one of the reasons why I'm looking at the critiques is because I want people to hear what you actually have to say, because when I hear the critiques, I don't feel like they're engaging your questions. And yeah. I feel like you have been dismissed. One of the, the other critiques that was brought up was that by encouraging or approving of this kind of view of women, uh, that you're opening the door for the next wave of gay and lesbian rights within the church. And this is exactly what's going to happen. Look at what happened in the church the last 50 years. And you're being a pawn, actually, is what one person pretty much said mm -hmm. for gay and lesbian activists. How mm -hmm. would you respond to that? I don't even know where they're making that leap from. Um, I'm looking at the word. <laughs> right. <laughs> and God loves the men and women in his church. Mm -hmm. God loves his church. And I'm just talking about discipleship. Now, is male and female in the same category then as sexual sin? I mean, like, obviously sexual sin has, is... Uh, performed by men and women, mm -hmm. um, and there's perversion. But I would say that what I'm talking about here with Christ's spousal love for his bride, that is where we're going to have the best arguments then against the sin of homosexuality and transgenderism and be able to speak about true identity um, and, and what our bodies speak. Mm -hmm. So um, they use this as like a slippery slope argument, yes. which really bothers me because it's just a fear. It's, it's, it's fear mongering. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, Amy's dangerous. So they're going to use this fear language to vilify me. Well, you and are dangerous, but in the right way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And, no, I, and I, I appreciate you clarifying that because, like I said, I don't see people engaging with what you actually say. They, they're extrapolating from what one or two sentences and then making this big boogie bear out of whatever. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many nuances within the, um, the way the church handles um, those who struggle with same sex attraction and a uh, gender mm -hmm. identity as well. Like um, I think that we need to be able to maintain the dignity of personhood in mm -hmm. all people. Absolutely. Um, and so I want to be able to minister to them. Well, you know, I'm going to call sin what it is. Um, and it's same with, um, what I'm, when I talk about friendship between the sexes, you know, you want to call sin for what it is and take it very seriously. Yes. Um, but that's the, all the more reason, the reason why it's so serious is because we are made in the image of God mm -hmm. and, uh, he's given us our bodies for a reason. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I want to make positive arguments too, and be able to minister well to all people and not just, um, shut the door to any kind of good conversations there. That's very much our, our philosophy around here. If we can have the conversation, then there, there's a chance for growth on both parties' part, not just mm -hmm. one. There's a lot of same-sex attracted Christians who are struggling mm -hmm. because they do see homosexuality to be a sin. Mm -hmm. um, so how can we minister well to them? Yes. And we, Nathan and I have, are longtime friends of Dennis Jernigan. And, uh, you know, he's got a great testimony on his battle with that. And mm -hmm. even within the church, it's interesting to how many people are against him. And he's still having to fight people who are on the outside of the church who are against him. And he's like, mm -hmm. I just want to focus on who God says I am. Mm -hmm. And so I see this kind of dialogue dovetailing nicely with, with those two topics. Mm -hmm. So what are some practical ways that churches can help women find their voice and use it in appropriate ways and in God glorifying ways? Yeah. I mean, I think first and foremost, we have to be able to read scripture well mm -hmm. together. Um, and that's why I start my book with just like recovering the way that we read scripture. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's going to begin with the leadership and that, that was the, the more narrow target audience I really have in my book is and that's why I asked so many questions, because I want church leaders to lead mm -hmm. <laughs> the way in these conversations. And so I have ch uh, questions at the end of each chapter, which I would love to see, you know, the Presbyterian Church, a session of elders or Baptist Church, you know, whatever you're calling your, your leadership there, um, to be discussing those together as leadership and then communicating well with the congregation. Um, so then there's lots of things to consider. And those questions, and, and I don't expect everyone to come to the same conclusions of how that's going to look. Right. But I don't think that um, it's good to walk into a church and just have a whole male culture there. So um, if you have male leadership, if that's 
that's your conviction, like it is mine in your church. I, I believe that they should be um, serving the whole congregation well and their own leadership will be served well by building relationships with women in the church, finding who has the theological vigor um, and investing in them well, helping them to train others, um, tapping into like a group of women at your church to see like, what are the struggles? Um, how are my sermons landing uh, with the women in the church? Um, is there is there particular areas of need that some women are having that uh, we're not addressing? I think that it's extremely important to also train some women as kind of um, representatives and advocates for, you know, to get up in front of the church and say, look, abuse is a real problem in the church. Mm -hmm. Um, It's being exposed everywhere. We love our sisters and our brothers. And so if you're a woman who is being abused, maybe it's intimidating for you to come to a session of male leadership. And, and talk about that. So we have these women who uh, we've put through training uh, to be able to, you can approach, you can share your, your struggles with them, and they will come alongside of you um, in, in meeting with us. And we will help you get the help that you need. You know, like, That's I think we need to just be so much more um, thinking ahead on these things and not just reacting to Yes. Uh, as someone who's been in an abusive marriage, who, who yeah. got out of it, despite the fact that, you know, I was never supposed to get divorced um, right. and, and had to go to the male leadership and say, hey, I need help to deal with my husband and was basically told to pray more, be more mm-hmm. submissive. Oh, I'm you so know. sorry. But, well, no. yeah, the great I've heard thing that is, over and over and over oh, again. Yes, it, exactly. The great thing is it gives me credibility when I speak with other women who are in that situation. So God has really used it. And, I, and so I can actually be grateful for it in retrospect. Yeah. But the, the, what you're saying here is something that I'm seeing so many churches being resistant to because of that underlying idea that we are a threat. Our biology mm-hmm. is a mm-hmm. threat. And so instead of being something life-giving, not just yeah. physically, we, our, our emotions can't be life-giving. Our brains can't be life-giving. We're just supposed to be biologically life-giving. Right. Yeah. Now we're breed stock. (laughs) Yeah. And, and I, you know, I, with the metaphor of Christ and his church, I really think that, um, and that typology, um, the church itself is supposed to be Mm life-giving, right? Um, and we have the gospel. (laughs) So, um, we should be seeing, um, I think the ministry and discipleship starts by sitting under the preached word and, and partaking in the sacraments. But then we should be seeing that overflowing then with fruit in the life of the church and um, reciprocity between the male and the female voice all over the place. Now, okay, you've used this term reciprocity a couple of times, and I've seen it in in a lot of your your writings. Tell us what that looks like to you, because I think well, it it looks like real participation. Um, Women aren't just looked at for help in the nursery or signing up for the potluck meals for who's having babies and, and in surgery. Those are great things, but um, that they are actually able to participate in the theological heart of the church as well, um, that their voice is sought out, um, that it's fructifying the male voice too. Um, I believe that men and women um, synergetically, if we have a good relationship with um, our contributions, and, and how we're communicating uh, the gospel and, and, and God's word and our own stories and incorporating that into it um, and, and promoting one another's holiness and upholding all these one another verses and scripture, um, that is going to be dynamic and that is going to be fruitful. That is going to show life in the church and it's going to produce, you know, more life. Um, um, and vitality. You can't see me laughing over here because one of the first things I always tell new church leadership when, I, when I've had to change churches, if you ever want to see an act of God, put me in a room full of three-year-olds. And if we all come out alive, he's been there and he's been busy. So, <laughs> and you don't want to eat my cooking. I can promise you that. So <laughs> this is... And one woman came to me from a local church who, um, she actually took a little job, extra job doing some nursery work on Wednesday nights at our church. But she said that where she was, um, everything was so divided. Uh, the women had the the breakfasts or whatever Mm -hmm. type of thing and and the making the casseroles for the, the, the people in, um, surgery. And she's like, those are good things like cooking for people, but that's just not what I do. Mm -hmm. She's a welder. 
And she's like, I wanted to help out with this family that was moving and needed moving help, but they were only asking the men in the church. Yes. And it's just so odd. Why wouldn't we take these as opportunities for men and women, brothers and sisters, to serve together? Well, you know, we, we're all um, victims of our biology in our, this day and age, and we live in a sex-crazed world, and all of us must be secretly just barely hanging onto that beast by the end of the leash. And, and I mean, is it too hard for a woman to carry a toaster into a home? <laughs> I think we, we got this. <laughs> I'm loving this. I have a feeling you and I could talk all day. I, I want to <laughs> ask a couple of questions, and I know you've got things to do with your time, and uh, I don't want to keep you forever, but... Is there anything you would have changed about this particular book? So Ooh, that is a good question. Um, that would take some reflection. I'm sure that there's stuff I would change. Um, it's very hard pushing that send button with your final. <laughs> yes. Um, you never feel like it's as good as it can be. Um, and so I'm sure that there's a lot of ways that we can improve. <laughs> the book. Um, this will be a good reason to have you back because you'll write the next book. <laughs> you know I stand behind it and um and I am I am being sharpened by some of the the good questions and critique and I would like to see more more written about it there are some places where people have said I wish you would have um elaborated more here Mm -hmm. and uh then I thought well I could have done that yeah so um there are places that I would like definitely go back and change um I think it'd be pretty scary to say say the opposite. Um, (laughs) I don't think any writer is completely content with the final product. There's always something. (laughs) So what does this book cost you personally? I mean, we kind of see the professional fallout, but behind Twitter, beyond that, Mm -hmm. how's this impacted you? That's a painful question, actually. Um, I'm sorry, I had to ask. It's affected my church, um, which very, you know, I found out one of my own elders was a part of this hateful Facebook group uh, that harasses me. Um, I tried not to impose my writing on my church. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm a learner. And there's so many wonderful, intelligent people at my church to learn from. I'm not, I guess people maybe picture me in there trying to champion all these women to do this and this and that or whatever, but it's not like that. And um, so to have all this negative attention, um, like with a flashlight on my Mm -hmm. elders and my church. Um, I love my church. Mm -hmm. I love my um, session. And and so I want to work with them. And that has been painful to have to go through that process. Um, And then for like my brothers and sisters that I worship beside to see like all this controversy. Um, And, you know, even that elder, uh, who was in the group, I, I really looked up to him and, and I love his family. So it, it was such a painful violation of trust. Um, and then, so that was bad. And then obviously, uh, everything that happened with the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, which I worked with for seven years, um, that was, you know, it was just kind of sad. Mm-hmm. Um, I do see in God's providence, though, that I needed a space of my own. So I think you're creating it very effectively. Thank you. Yeah. And it's really, you know, one of the big ways this book has affected me is that I've been um, painfully challenged to grow, you know, <laughs> in how you handle and uh, in, in knowing the difference between just like jerks on the Internet, um, good critique that mm-hmm. I should listen to. People who say things that might be hurtful, but, you know, everybody says dumb stuff on the internet sometimes, so just offer them some grace, you know, mm-hmm. um, or then people who are really, truly targeting you and harassing. I mean, you know, when they're calling ahead of my speaking engagements and warning people that I'm dangerous and, you know, trying to sabotage my Amazon page and, and have all these plans. Um, so behaving then, like good Christians. Yeah. And then what you stand <laughs> up to and what you don't, because, um, you know, they're church officers, and I believe that church officers should be held accountable. Like, you yes. should not be in a position of spiritual authority and, and behave like that. Um, because when we talk about qualified male uh, pastors and elders, well, qualification part is extremely important. <laughs> it's not right. just any man. Um, and I think it disqualifies you to treat people like this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's spiritual abuse. And I think that's a, a real problem right now. Yes. Um, 
We're actually going to interview on that one. Down a lot of that with my writing, like you know, when I wrote the book, I didn't um, intend it for like the audience of like the most extreme hateful groups. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> they've they've really, you know, gotten a lot of attention on this, but um, yeah. So and then to be able to distinguish between all those things and have that wisdom, which I definitely have to pray for, and mm-hmm. and. And, and patience uh, on just the process of how this all gets handled. Um, it seems like, and, and this is really, it's been hard truths, but it seems like the, the victims have to do a lot of their own work yes. to, to get any of this exposed and dealt with. And um, mm-hmm. so in this situation, I've seen women have to do a lot of the work. Mm-hmm. Um, and then not only do you have to do the work, but then you pay the cost. Because then they turn on you. Oh, you're the rebellious woman now. So yeah. why should you be listened to? And that's hard to, to um, you know, to see my husband be talked about the way he's a loving man. To see my church be talked about the way it is, the leadership there. Um, it's, you know, it's hard to deal with all that. My children are older. Like I have a 21-year-old and an 18-year-old and a 15-year-old. So my, my older daughters, they see what's being said about me on Twitter. Yeah, you can't shield them um, at that age. Yeah, and so then they know that this is being said by church officers. And so they have a lot of questions, you know, mm-hmm. um, and a lot of anger. Yeah. Would you do it so again? Would mm-hmm. I do it again? Um, yes, I feel like God has led me. <laughs> uh, I love that. <laughs> compelled to do this, and there's a cost to it, though, you know. I've never had uh, this ambition to be, like, some headlining conference speaker, author, um, guy can use somebody else tomorrow. Like if, mm-hmm. if I don't get to continue writing because of this one book or get to continue, whatever it is, um, then, then I served, <laughs> I spoke the truth and, um, and I can lay my head on my pillow at night and I can do something else. I don't have to write to be happy, um, and have joy and God will use other people. Um, who am I? Like you asked at the beginning <laughs> of the show. <laughs> nice little so, book in um, there. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel proud of speaking truth in hard places. Um and I don't want to be against like certain people. I just think the church needs some reformation and that's in my own confessions mm-hmm. that the church is reformed and always reforming. There's mm-hmm. always going to be sin, there's always going to be error, um and it needs to be confronted. Right. Oh, Amy, I have enjoyed having you on the show, and I want you to know how much restraint I had to to keep from going off these rabbit trails. I understand. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I know you do, and that's the reason. You, I, I love the fact that that you are bringing this um, bringing this conversation to the table, and that you have asked questions, and that you haven't come across as the final authority. And I think a lot of people don't realize that if they haven't read your books, you're not setting yourself up as I'm the person who has the answers. I'm the person who can ask the questions. And, and I appreciate the bravery and courage you've shown in that because anybody who's watching this knows there's a cost. And so I, I, one of the things I want to encourage you with is there are people who are praying for you. There are people who know what it's like to be in your situation. And, uh, we just, we appreciate there's one more who's, you know, helping spread the heat a little bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thank you been... very much. And I really appreciate the prayers. Sure. Well, we, we appreciate you taking out time to, to spend with us. I know that, you know, life's busy, especially, you know, you said your husband's an educator this time of year is mm-hmm. insane, no matter, it is. <laughs> no matter what else is going on. Um, so yes, we do appreciate that. And yeah, well, thanks for asking such good questions. It was a good conversation. Thank you for having yeah. me on. Yeah, we had fun. Hopefully we'll be able to have you back uh, sometime. Write another Sounds book. Good. Yeah, Cause yeah, another definitely. fire storm. <laughs> Working on it. So, and for <laughs> everyone who's uh, joined us for the conversation, um, be sure if you haven't, go check out Amy's book, uh, Recovering from Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. And uh, some of the others that she talked about, we'll be sure to list all those in the show notes um, we'll have so links. you can find them and we'll link mm-hmm. back to it. And Amy, thanks again. And I guess... Uh, Everyone else, have a good week, and we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks, Amy. Bye. You've been listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.